Thank you all for being here. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about prostate cancer screening, hopefully in an attempt to help everyone make a better informed decision. Um, you kind of already heard all this, but I'll give you a quick moment to look at my adorable family, and then we'll kind of jump into it. So the objectives for tonight, um, my hope is to inform you about prostate cancer, to educate you a little bit about just some of the basics of medical screening, to review some guidelines regarding uh, prostate cancer screening, and hopefully to empower you to make a more informed decision about prostate cancer screening. So I guess first, what is the prostate? Um, so in this picture, the prostate is this kind of little orange yellow ball there sort of in the middle of the pelvis. And it's described as a walnut sized or some people say ping pong ball sized gland. It sits in front of the rectum and then below the bladder. Only men have prostates. Um, it produces fluid that help carry sperm during ejaculation and it surrounds the urethra as it exits the bladder. So as it sits below the bladder, it sort of surrounds the tube that carries the urine out. And that's where a lot of the symptoms from prostate diseases come from, like urinary frequency or feeling like you can't empty your bladder completely. So what are some of the diseases that can occur in the prostate? Well, one is prostatitis. That is an infection or an inflammation of the gland. Benign prostatic hypertrophy, probably the most common issue that we see with the prostate. And that just means normal growth. So as men get older, the prostate gets bigger, and we call that BPH. And then lastly, prostate cancer, which we'll spend some time talking about tonight. So how common is prostate cancer? There's about 1.3 million cases per year worldwide, 192,000 cases per year in the US. And that makes prostate cancer the third leading cause of cancer. Um, behind breast and lung, and that makes it the second most common cancer in men. Men have about a 12% lifetime risk of developing prostate cancer. And then compared to how deadly prostate cancer is, there's about 359,000 deaths per year worldwide, and about 33,000 deaths per year in the US. And that equates to about a 2.4% lifetime risk of dying from prostate cancer. So as you can see, there's a pretty big difference between the incidence of prostate cancer and the number of people who actually die from prostate cancer. And in medicine, there's a saying that we use a lot, um, most men die with prostate cancer, not from prostate cancer. So to say that another way, most men die of something else before their prostate cancer would kill them. One of the ways that we know that is a study that looked at autopsies. So men who had died for other reasons, and then they just evaluated the prostate gland. In men 50 to 70, about 30% of them would actually have some evidence of prostate cancer in the prostate gland. And then in men over 70 years old, about 70% of them actually would have some evidence of prostate cancer within the gland. So, what puts someone at risk of developing prostate cancer? Well, first of all, just having a prostate. All men have some baseline risk just by the nature that they have a prostate. But age is also a really significant risk factor. So prostate cancer is very rare in men under 50, and then that risk continues to increase as men get older. African-American ethnicity seems to be a risk factor, um, not only for more commonly being diagnosed with prostate cancer, but also dying from prostate cancer. And the evidence is a little unclear whether that means that African American men tend to just get more aggressive forms of prostate cancer or if there's some disparities in care. Having a family history can put, increase your risk of prostate cancer. Um, and so a first degree relative, that's a brother or a father who has prostate cancer would increase your risk. But also a female relative who has a cancer related to BRCA. BRCA is a genetic mutation that increases a woman's risk of either breast or ovarian cancer, um, and that can relate to a man's risk of prostate cancer as well. Diet also has an effect on your risk for prostate cancer, so diets that are higher in animal fats, animal products, and lower in vegetables seem to carry a higher risk of prostate cancer as well. So before we sort of get into the specifics about prostate cancer screening, I just wanted to spend a couple minutes in talking about screening tests more generally. And so a screening test is something um, given to an asymptomatic person, so someone who has no symptoms of the disease, to determine the likelihood of them having the disease. 
screening tests don't always diagnose the disease. So there's usually other tests that um, are needed to complete the evaluation to actually determine if you have the disease or not. And the goal of screening is to reduce morbidity and mortality, so bad things or death, from the disease by detecting it early when treatment is usually more successful. And I'm just gonna tangent for a second to just talk about these definitions for a second. As I made this slide, I could sort of imagine people's eyes rolling because this is pretty basic stuff, but this is actually a conversation that I have probably daily in our office. And so two important things to remember, three important things to remember. One, when I say screening tests, you can also think preventative tests. Those words kind of mean the same thing. And then the two aspects of this that are important is you can't have uh, symptoms of the disease and screen for it. And you can't have a disease where early intervention doesn't make any difference and call that a screen. In two ways, this comes up a lot. And since we're talking about guys, I'll, I'll stick with that theme. If a guy comes in and says, hey, doc, I'm feeling tired. I can't exercise like I used to. My sex life isn't exactly what it used to be. My neighbor down the street started testosterone a couple weeks ago, and I want you to order a testosterone test for me, but make sure you code that as preventative because then insurance will pay for it. By definition, you have symptoms of a disease. It's not a screening or preventative test when I order that, and insurance isn't gonna pay for it. That's where the conversation comes in a lot. So let's kind of flip that around. Let's say the same guy comes in and he says, hey, I feel great, but my neighbor down the street started testosterone in a couple weeks, and I want you to order a testosterone test and make sure you code that as preventative because I want insurance to pay for it. A lot of studies have shown now that even if you supplement testosterone in someone whose numbers are low, if they weren't symptomatic to begin with, they're likely to get a lot of benefit from that. And so for that same reason now, there's no benefit to early detection or, prevent or treatment. Again, not a screening test, and insurance unlikely to pay for it. So a little tangential, but it's kind of relevant to day-to-day -day practice for us. So what makes a good screening test? We're going to do a little biostatistic work here. Um, the test needs to be highly sensitive and specific. We'll talk a little bit more about what that means. It needs to have a high predictive value. Again, we'll kind of go into that in more detail. It needs to be cost effective. It's always uncomfortable to talk about cost when you're talking about medical care, but it is relevant. Um, one of the things that's important is that is that when we screen for diseases, the cost benefit ratio is better if the disease is common. So if we can find something in a lot of people, we've done more good. Sometimes we don't screen for really rare diseases just because the benefit isn't there and the cost of screening could be too high. But that isn't always the case. So the cost needs to be compared to the treatment. So an example of a really rare disease that we still screen for is PKU, which is a error of metabolism that newborn babies can have, where essentially they can't break down carbohydrates apparently, and the effects of that disease are devastating to children. It's very rare, but the test is super cheap. And the treatment is really, really easy. So because the test is cheap, the treatment is easy, and the intervention is important, we go ahead and we screen all newborns for that. So as we look at screening tests, we do look at the cost benefit to the population or to the system as well. The test needs to be easily available, right? If you have a screening test but no one can get it, it's not very helpful. It needs to be safe and only create minimal discomfort. If the test is worse than the disease, it's probably not gonna be utilized very often. And you need to have appropriate follow-up. So there's no point in screening for something that you can't do something about. And then this last one is actually more about the diseases that are good to be screened for rather than tests. But the diseases that we screen for need to have serious and irreversible consequences if not treated early. So early detection needs to be really beneficial. If, you, if there's no difference between catching something late or catching something early, there's no great benefit in screening for that. So talk a little bit more about a couple of those terms. So sensitivity and specificity, I think most people have a general idea of kind of what those terms mean. But in terms of medical testing, they're, they're actually a little more specific. Um, so sensitivity and specificity are characteristics of a test. They're sort of tests of a test. So basically for sensitivity, you give a population a gold standard test, and then everybody that's positive, you give them the test that you're working on. The sensitivity is that test's ability to be positive in someone that you know has the disease. So I'm a simple guy. Sensitivity has two S's. Sensitivity is a test's ability to identify the sick as sick. 
Specificity is just the opposite of that. So you take that same group of people, you apply a gold standard test. Everybody who doesn't have the disease gets the test in question. The test's ability to be negative for those people is its specificity. So it's the test's ability to identify the well as well. If a test has low sensitivity, you're gonna get more false negatives. And if a test has low specificity, you're gonna get more false positives. And this, I promise, will become relevant um, as we talk a little bit more. So when you apply those test characteristics to a population, then you're talking about the test's predictive values. So very similar to sensitivity, but positive predictive value is just kind of the flip of it. So in positive predictive value, it's the likelihood that a person is, has the disease if the test is positive. So remember, sensitivity was the likelihood that the test is positive if the person has the disease. This is just the flip. So if you come back with a positive strep test, how likely is it that you have strep? That's the positive predictive value. If, the, if that is low, you wind up with false positives. And that leads to overdiagnosis. So just the opposite of that, the likelihood that a person is well when a test is negative is the negative predictive value. And if that's not very good, you're gonna wind up with false negatives. And that means that you've missed cases. That's it for biostatistics, I promise, but um, we'll talk about that as it relates to, to prostate screening. So what are the tests that we have? There are really only two. Um, the digital rectal exam, or is often referred to as the DRE, and the prostate-specific antigen, or, or PSA. So we'll talk a little bit about the digital rectal exam first. Um, usually done in a, in a male patient for prostate screening, um, with the patient sort of bent over the table. A finger is inserted into the rectum, and then through the wall of the rectum, you try to feel the prostate gland for size or for texture. You're kind of feeling for nodules in the prostate. So what do we know about that test? We know that early cancers are not palpable. And remember, a good screening test catches things early. A positive digital rectal exam, so meaning a finding, a nodule or a really big size of the prostate, equals a nine-fold increase in odds that that person already has metastatic prostate cancer. And again, a good screen finds things early. Because this is a physical exam, there's a lot of variability between providers. So someone who has done 10 of these a week for 20 years probably has a better sense of what a normal or an abnormal prostate feels like than someone who has only just graduated from med school and only done a few of them. To sort of bear that out a little bit more, they did a study where they took urologists, which by, are probably the gold standard of people who are good at this, because they do them a lot, and they had multiple urologists do digital rectal exams on the same patient. They disagreed with each other 20% of the time. So it's not, it's not a reproducible test. The results are sort of different between different providers. And then when you do a PSA, and you add the findings of a digital rectal exam, you only increase the detection of prostate cancer about 1%. So it doesn't add a lot to the other tests that we have. So now, since we're all good statisticians, we can kind of look at some of these numbers related to a digital rectal exam. So the sensitivity, remember the, that means that the test is positive when you have prostate cancer, is 51%. That leads to about 49% false negatives. It's a coin toss. The specificity, test ability to be negative when you don't have prostate cancer, 59%, so a little bit better, but that still leads to about 41% false positive rate. Now applied that to a population, the positive predictive value, the likelihood that you have prostate cancer when your digital rectal exam is positive, is about 41%. So about 59% of the time, that's a false positive test. And then the negative predictive value, again, remember that means if the test is negative, you don't have the disease, is about 64%. So a little bit better, um, but still about 46% false negatives from that test. So with that in mind, the digital rectal exam is not a reasonable test to screen for prostate cancer. A digital rectal exam is only done as part of a routine physical to screen for prostate cancer. And so as a result of us having a better understanding of this, 
Digital record exams are generally not done anymore as part of a routine physical. People find that really hard to believe. I think a lot of guys feel like I'm jipping them when I don't do the rectal exam as part of their exam. But there's really no reason to do that as a screen. If there's a problem that you're working up, absolutely. But as a screen, probably should not be getting digital rectal exams. So the other test that we have is the PSA or prostate specific antigen. So what is that? It's a protein that is produced by the prostate that then can be measured in the blood. So it's just a blood draw. Experiments around PSAs started in the 60s. So this is not a particularly old test. Um, and then they really sort of got that honed into a reproducible quantitative test around the 80s. And when that happened, they started looking at this as a marker for prostate cancer. So what do we know about PSAs? We know that it's elevated in prostate cancer. There is a good concordance between those two, but it's also elevated in other things. The most common reason is BPH, or just benign growth of the prostate that happens in all men. But it can also be in elevated in infection, that's prostatitis, in trauma, that's also prostatitis, or just from sexual activity. Remember, the function of the prostate gland is to produce fluid to help move the sperm. So just with activation through sex, you can get an, ele an elevated reading in your PSA. But the PSA can also be falsely decreased, um, and usually from, from medications or drugs. So, um, a really important class for this are 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. Those are medicines that we use to treat benign growth of the prostate, or BPH. And some common names for that are Propecia, or Proscar, or Abadart, the generics are Dutasteride or Finasteride. They actually reduce the PSA up to about 50%. And just kind of as normal routine, if we're doing a PSA on a guy who's on one of those meds, we usually just double the value to actually identify what their real risk um, is. NSAIDs or anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen or Motrin or Aleve or aspirin um, can also reduce the PSA by up to about 40%. There's a lot more that needs to be figured out about that. This is not reproducible in people who smoke, but the level of smoking is not understood yet to sort of know when we need to account for this and when we don't. So. If you're taking an anti-inflammatory really regularly, it's harder to know exactly what your PSA means. Thiazide diuretics were, are a particular class of water pill, like hydrochlorothiazide, which a lot of people take for blood pressure, also reduces um, PSA about 26%. And I'm, I'm gonna group those three together because although they reduce the PSA, they do not reduce a man's risk of developing prostate cancer. They are falsely lowering the PSA, they're not actually reducing risk. Different to that are statins, and statins are cholesterol medications like Lipitor or Crestor. Their reduction is less, about 4%, but they actually also seem to reduce the incidence of prostate cancer. So they're not artificially lowering the PSA, they're actually reducing a guy's risk. So again, I think there'll probably be a lot more studies around this as sort of a secondary benefit to what the statins can offer. So what about those numbers that we looked at for the digital rectal exam as they would apply for the PSA? Well, it gets a lot harder. So for one thing, prostate cancer and PSAs increase with age. So when you try to do a study about that, the study can come up with different values based on how many participants were of a particular age in the study group. So it kind of skews the predictive value of the PSA test. Also, when we talked about these before, sort of the test was positive or negative, but that isn't true for PSA. PSA is a quantitative test, means you get a number back when you do that analysis. And so, depending on the number that you choose also changes then the specificity, sensitivity, and predictive value. Usually, we say that a PSA of four or less is considered normal, and four or over is considered abnormal. But again, that makes the analysis of specificity, sensitivity, and predictive value much, diff much harder. There's also a difference between testing someone once and testing them serially. So oftentimes if guys are getting tested with PSAs, they're doing that every year or every other year. And that sort of repeat testing also changes the predictive value of the test. So I, I did the numbers as best we could. As you can see, the sensitivity has a pretty big range. Some studies say it's as bad as 20, and some, some studies say it's as good as 80. 
Specificity, smaller range, but still pretty broad, 60% all the way up to about 94%. We can hone that down a little bit more when we talk about predictive value. And again, remember that's your likelihood of having the disease if the test is positive or not having the disease if the test is negative. So the positive predictive value is about 30%. Not very good. It's about 70% false positives. And, re and again, remember, a false positive in this case means that we are over-diagnosing prostate cancer. The negative predictive value is a little better. It's about 85%. And again, that means that your test was negative, so you, don't, you likely don't have prostate cancer. Still a 15% false negative rate. And that equals missed cases, so people who we did not catch their prostate cancer. So should we use the PSA? The numbers are less clear about this one. So we can look for some expert guidance around this. So the USPSTF, which is what most of your primary care providers probably follow, it stands for the United States Preventative Services Task Force. Um, they do not recommend for or against testing. They say that you should have a conversation with your provider starting at age 55 and ending at age 69, but there's an asterisk about that. So the end age for this is based on the idea that most people agree that you should not screen for prostate cancer if your life expectancy is less than 10 years. Average life expectancy for a guy in the US is about 80, so they say stop screening around 70. I work in Boulder County, and I have 80-year-olds who ride their bike up Flagstaff three times a week, so that is not applicable to every patient, so just know that it's really less than, greater than 10-year life expectancy, not a hard cutoff of 70. The American College of Physicians, very similar guidelines. Shared decision-making from 50 to 70, younger if you have significant risk factors. The National Cancer Institute actually said the data is so unclear that we, we can't even make a determination whether or not you should be screened. The American Uro Urological Association um, says screen early if there's increased risk, so between 40 and 54. But then that same recommendation, between 55 and 70, just have a conversation with your provider to, and decide what's right for you. They add one little aspect. They say if you do decide to screen, you probably don't need to do it every year. Every other year is enough. The American Cancer Society, again, in, endorses shared decision making. And then I threw this last one in here just to sort of bring up a point. Choosing Wisely is an organization whose goal is to save money in the medical economy. One of the ways that we use that a lot is when we're ordering um, radiology imaging. So everything in the world does not need an MRI. If you can diagnose this with, a, with an X-ray, you don't need an MRI. If you, need to, if you can diagnose it with an ultrasound, you don't need an MRI. And Choosing Wisely choosing wisely rather, gives us a lot of guidance in terms of cost-effective imaging. Their recommendation is to not screen at all. But again, remember, their goal is to save money. So sometimes organizations' recommendations can be somewhat called into question if you look at what their overarching goal is as an organization. So if you're supposed to have this shared decision-making conversation, What's the approach to that? How do, you, how do you know even what to talk about? So there's some studies that may give us some guidance for that. There's a really big European study that went on for a really long time, and they found that in men who screened regularly, there is a 20% lower chance of dying from prostate cancer after 13 years. In that same group of men who were screened regularly, there was a 30% lower chance of being diagnosed with metastatic prostate cancer. It was clear that more screening finds earlier disease, and we know that the five-year survival for early-stage prostate cancer is close to 100%. We also know that the PSA test is easy, it's pretty cheap, and it's pretty accurate. So on the flip of that, in the same study, one fewer death for 1,000 men screened after 13 years. So basically what that means is that the 20% lower chance of dying came from the need to screen 1,000 men annually for 13 years to save a single life. We also know from that study that 75% of men with an, elevated, with an elevated PSA went on to get a prostate biopsy that was normal. So the implication there is that we were doing unnecessary testing on 75% of the men who had an elevated PSA. 
The five-year survival rate for early prostate cancer is 100%. Oh, but wait, that was a pro. That's on the both sides because the survival rate is the same in early prostate cancer at five years, whether you treat it or not. Again, most cancers, most prostate cancers are slow growing. You die with prostate cancer, not of prostate cancer. And most cancers that are found are unlikely to be the cause of death or disability in most patients. So to put all of that sort of wordy slide in a different context, because a picture is worth a thousand years, um, this top part here, got it, is the incidence or the rate at which we were identifying prostate cancer. So this is numbers of cases identified and then years across the bottom. So again, remember, we sort of figured out how to do the PSA in 1980. Around 1990, a bunch of organizations came out and said, every man should be screened with a PSA every year. And when that happened, we found a bunch more prostate cancer. There's a little blip here, but actually if you just sort of take this line, it's pretty straight and pretty steep across that time. And that goes up to about 2012. In 2012, a bunch of organizations said, nope, we were wrong, we're hurting guys by doing this. They're getting unnecessary biopsies, they're getting unnecessary surgeries. Nobody should get a PSA, stop doing them, it's a bad test. And when that happened, the detection rate, oh, I lost the clinky. The detection rate went really far down. And then in 2018, the recommendations that we just reviewed started to come back, and you can see now there's a little blip back up in terms of how much cancer we're detecting. But compare that to mortality, which is the orange line across the bottom. So despite those big swings in finding more cancer, not finding as much cancer, starting to find more of it, mortality rate didn't change very much. And in some studies, didn't change at all. So we know some data, but the data isn't very clear. So if you're supposed to have this conversation, what other tools could you use to sort of help make a decision? And these are some ideas that are from some of the resources that I used. One is to just think about, do you even want to know if you have prostate cancer? If you're the kind of person who doesn't care, don't screen. Would you choose to be treated? Again, if you, if you found out you had prostate cancer but said, there's no way I'm going through a biopsy or radiation or a surgery, does it make sense to screen? How do you feel about the risks of being treated? Is the, is, the, is the treatment worse than the disease? How do you feel about the possibility, although small, of getting an aggressive prostate cancer? And then lastly, would you be willing to accept the side effects from treatment for what we know is a small chance of living a little bit longer? Well, what we know is that medicine stands still for no man, as do recommendations. So, as all of these recommendations have bounced back and forth, everybody gets a prostate a PSA, nobody gets a PSA, talk about a PSA. During all of that time, we started getting more information about how better to manage PSAs. And the PSAs that always mess everybody up are the ones that are called in the gray zone. So that's a PSA of four to 10. So not skyrocketed high, but not normal. So two approaches have sort of come out of this new concept about how to manage prostate cancer. One is called watchful waiting, and then watchful waiting slightly more aggressive brother is called active surveillance. So watchful waiting is a palliative approach, means not really interested in curing the disease, we just wanna make sure people are comfortable. You may get occasional PSAs, but they're not gonna be super frequent. You will likely not get any biopsies, or if you do, they're gonna be pretty limited. And treatment, aggressive treatment like surgery or radiation, is gonna be late and only based on symptoms. This is a good approach for men who are either older or who are sicker, have a lot of other comorbidities, we call them. Slightly more aggressive approach to that is called active surveillance. So this is actually a curative approach. So the goal here is to cure people of their prostate cancer. And so as a result of that, you're gonna get more frequent PSAs, I've seen people getting them as often as every three months. You will probably get repeat biopsies at some interval. And then more aggressive treatment is gonna be earlier and based on the lab findings and the Gleason score. And the Gleason score is kind of an evaluation of the cell structure based on those prostate biopsies. This is a better approach for younger men or men who are in particularly good health. 
There's also been some advances in PSA testing that we have. So these aren't screens, but these are ways to evaluate an elevated PSA. So one is called age-adjusted PSA. As I've mentioned a couple times, PSA and prostate size get bigger as men get older. So they basically made a new scale for what normal is, and that normal increases as age increases. And so that can help detect whether this is just a normal PSA or if this actually indicates a problem. PSA velocity is really just looking at the rate of change. So you do PSAs over time, and you look at how quickly they're changing. The idea there is cancer would increase the rate of PSA faster than just benign growth. So if it's moving really quickly, perhaps more worrisome for prostate cancer. PSA density would involve you getting a transrectal ultrasound to evaluate the size of your prostate, and then they compare the PSA number to the volume of your prostate. Again, just trying to determine whether or not this is from regular growth or if this is something more worrisome. And then one that we see a lot, and actually with the rest of these on the other column, is the free and total PSA. And so let me just spend a minute to talk about how PSA is created. In the prostate gland, as the protein is being made, it's made first as this thing called pro-PSA. And then as it starts to filter through the little ducts and tubes, a bunch of chemicals are added onto it, and then a bunch of stuff is taken off of it, and it's excreted as free PSA. In cancer, though, the cellular structure of the gland starts to break down. And PSA at any form of its production can sort of leak out into the bloodstream. So when you compare the free PSA to the total PSA, you get a, a ratio of PSA that was created the normal way versus PSA that leaked out likely because there was a cancer. So the lower the free PSA, the more likely it is that you have a prostate cancer. These other tests are variations on that theme. So complexed PSA is an, uh, an earlier precursor of PSA that gets leaked out in prostate cancer. Percent pro-PSA is that very early stage kind of compared to free PSA. This one is interesting because this is actually approved as a screen for prostate cancer in the European Union. So there may be more about this to come in the US as we learn more about it. And then sort of the granddaddy of all these tests is the prostate health index, which takes a whole bunch of these and smushes them together. Again, you're trying to get as much information about the PSA so that you can make a good determination about what to do with it. So as you can see, the, the recommendations for this are a little wishy-washy. It's just about having a conversation. There's no like, do it, don't do it. And as I was doing this talk, I was sure that the question that would happen at the end is, well, Dr. Bundy, what do you do? And so I thought I would just answer that in advance. So kind of leaving science behind and just my own opinion or my own approach, and I have to do the disclaimer in my really fast radio voice that this does not represent the opinions of Boulder Community Health or any of those providers. Um, this is just what I think might be a good approach. So if the patient has an opinion, first I listen to the patient, and then second I listen to the patient, and then third I listen to the patient, and we kind of do what the patient wants to do. More often than not, though, the patient says, I don't know, you went to medical school, what should I do? I used to sort of hedge that bet and say, well, we don't really know, it's not a great test. Um, but actually, as a result of doing some of this information, I actually have come up with sort of a more decisive approach. So what I can do is remember the statistics that we looked at. So PSA has a positive predictive value of only 30%, which is terrible. But it has a negative predictive value of 85%. So if that test is negative, I'm 85% confident that you don't have prostate cancer. And then I can also remember the incidence of prostate cancer. So a 12% lifetime risk of getting it. That's an 88% likelihood of not getting it in your lifetime. And so if you just play the odds, it is way more likely if I order a PSA in you that it's gonna be normal, then it's gonna be positive. And if it's normal, less than four, I can, with pretty high certainty, tell you that you don't have prostate cancer. If you are one of those people for whom the PSA is over for, then I can rely and trust in the advancements that we've made in terms of how we are managing elevated PSAs, and I can educate the patient about those advancements so that they don't mistakenly get rushed into prostate biopsies or surgeries or radiation. This is just some uh, references that you can use to help 
gain a little more information about prostate cancer screening. Up to date is sort of like Google for medical providers. I use this 30 times a day, but they have a patient site as well. It's amazingly good information. National Cancer Institute, American Cancer Society, American Cl Society for Clinical Oncology, and the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Mayo Clinic. Um, these last four on here actually have interactive websites that will ask you questions and then based on your answer sort of give you a hedge as to whether or not it seems like you might be someone who's appropriate for cancer screening, for prostate cancer screening or not. Um, and with that, I will stop and maybe take some time for some questions. Great, thank you, doctor, so much for that information. We have, we have a few questions that have come in. <clears throat> the first one is for, um, for screening purposes. You may have answered this, but we're gonna ask it again. Sure. For screening purposes, do you recommend a test for free PSA? test along with the standard PSA test? No, and there's, there's no body, and by that I mean organization, not no person, but there's no organization that recommends that. So the distinction between free and total PSA is really only there to, an evalu to evaluate a PSA that is abnormal. That's in the US. Now again, remember, in the EU, they are now using a screen that differentiates that early form of PSA versus the more normal form, but that is not an approved test at all in the US. And currently, it is just the PSA and then acting on that PSA with those other tests if it happens to be elevated. Perfect, thank you. The second question is how reliable and how effective are ultrasound and MRI type of screenings? So again, neither of those are recommended as screening tests. Um, both of those would evaluate the size and an MRI uh, perhaps sort of look at the uh, cellular structure of the gland. So they may have some utility in determining whether or not a prostate is diseased with just benign growth versus cancer, but they're not useful in terms of just a screen. And particularly for the MRI, that kind of goes back to that cost-benefit analysis. MRIs are pretty expensive. To do MRIs on every guy over 50, just, it's, it's, not, it's not feasible. So good diagnostic test, not good screening test. Thank you, thank you. Could you explain what side effects of prostate-reducing drugs may be? So there are two classes of medications that we use for BPH or, or prostate enlargement. One is the, uh, the group that I mentioned. Those actually reduce the size of the prostate and by doing that hopefully relieve constriction on the tube, the ureter. Because those are actually um, blockers of testosterone, one of the most common side effects from those medications is a thing called gynecomastia, which essentially means you get an increase in breast tissue or even breast sensitivity. Some of those medications can also have some side effects with sexual function, um, and then there's a rare side effect called retrograde ejaculations, very rare. Um, those kind of relate to that. The other group that we use are called alpha blockers, which are actually blood pressure medications. They help to open the tube. So rather than trying to make the prostate smaller, these medicines help to make the tube bigger. Flomax is a really common one of those that we use that you may have heard of. Their side effects is that they can lower blood pressure. So dizziness is pretty common with those medications. And if the dose gets too high, you can actually see a reduction in absolute blood pressure, which for some people may not be a good thing. I understand that PSA levels can be increased for a short time, 24 to 48 hours, after riding a bicycle. So do you recommend staying off the bicycle before a test? Yeah, so that's really relevant um, in Boulder County because we have so many um, really great cyclists here. You know, I did my medical school and training in Ohio and I worked for a long time in rural Ohio. There it was guys on their tractors for really long times at the beginning of, of planting season and at harvest. And basically no PSA was ever thought to be valid in those periods of time because everybody had just spent six hours on a 20 year old Alice Chalmer tractor bouncing up and down. So yeah, that can absolutely 
increase the PSA value, which is why one of the first things that we would ever do if you have an elevation and we know you're a cyclist would be to repeat that after there'd been a period of time where you had been off the bike. Thank you, thanks. Uh, uh, we have a question. Uh, does prostate cancer have any notable symptoms? So they tend to be the same symptoms as benign growth. So as the prostate gets cancer, it also gets bigger, it also gets more malformed, but the symptoms are again related to the urinary issues because it tends to pinch off that ureter. So frequency of urination, waking up a lot at night to pee, weak stream, trouble stopping, kind of dribbling a little bit, feeling like you didn't empty your bladder completely when you go to pee. Those are all symptoms of prostate cancer, but they're also symptoms of benign growth and they're also symptoms of prostatitis. So unfortunately, all of the things that can go wrong with the prostate sort of present in the same way. <clears throat> Does a testosterone treatment raise or lower the risk of getting prostate cancer? Yeah, that is a great question. Whoever asked that, thank you. Um, so that was a huge point of controversy when testosterone replacement started to become popular. And it has been well proven now that testosterone does not increase risk of prostate cancer. However, testosterone can increase the rate at which prostate cancer grows if you have it when you start prostate, when you start testosterone. So it is really important if you are considering starting testosterone to know what your baseline PSA is and your baseline risk for prostate cancer, and then to monitor that as you are on symptom, or as you're on therapy, rather, sorry. The other side of that is that testosterone does increase benign growth of the prostate. So when you are on testosterone, you can see an elevation in your PSA level, and then it becomes a little trickier if you didn't have a good baseline to know, is that that you're feeding prostate cancer, or is that that you're just feeding the prostate itself? I'm 73 years old. My urologist never orders a, PA, a PSA test for me. Should I insist on one? It would depend on your health status. So again, remember, um, we, doctors and providers love to just follow guidelines, and the guidelines say stop at 70. So it's really easy to just not even bring this up in someone who's over 70. But again, we live in an amazingly healthy community. And if your life expectancy is more like 90 because you're super healthy, then there may be value in continuing to be screened. It's sort of a personal decision at that point, but definitely one that you should bring up to your urologist. How much does sexual activity increase the PSA? So there's no actual known percentage. We know that sexual activity has the possibility of increasing your PSA, but it sort of depends on the type of sex, how frequent that sex is, as to what that absolute elevation is going to be. So again, that becomes more relevant is if, if you get a PSA screen and it's kind of high, your provider might ask you about recent sexual activity and then ask you to abstain and then do a recheck maybe in a couple weeks or even a couple months just to sort of evaluate whether or not that elevation was because you had sex. Can you talk about diet and other holistic means to prevent prostate cancer? So the, the data that we know is that a diet that is really high in animal products, and that generally relates then to high in saturated fats, does increase risk. In different studies, that increase was sort of different percentages, so that's why I didn't really present it, because it wasn't, wasn't particularly clear to me what the absolute risk was, because it kind of varies by your diet. Um, so I think, in general, a diet that is more plant-based, lots of fruits and vegetables, sort of eating the rainbow, um, and probably also low in pro-inflammatory foods, so low in sugar, low in refined carbohydrates, probably reduces risk. My husband's doctor discouraged a PSA for four years because he felt a DRE was sufficient by the time he had one, he had stage two tumor, tumor and RH. So his doctor discouraged a, a PSA for four years because he felt the, the DRE was sufficient by the time he had uh, a PSA 
taken, he had stage two tumor and yeah. RH. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry for that experience, yeah. but um, I think the evidence is pretty clear now. And this has changed over time. Um, that the digital rectal exam is, is not a particularly good screen like we talked about. And if you're going to do a screen, the PSA is a better test as long as you manage it well. Um, I think recommendations change, and sometimes it takes, I think the average is about two years when a, when a guideline changed before it's widely adopted by the medical community. So, you know, there are some old school docs who still do digital rectal exams and think that, think that they're good. I would suggest that that's not really supported by the data. Do you treat prostatitis if you have it and an elevated PSE? Yeah. PSA? Yeah, for sure. So um, I guess you can go about that two ways. So if someone is coming in and is symptomatic of prostatitis, you would do a digital rectal exam. Again, remember, a screen is different than a diagnostic test. So if someone is talking about perineal or sort of groin pain, um, and you do an exam and the prostate feels big and kind of mushy, might do some other labs and their PSA is higher, they might even have a white count, the treatment for that is generally a course of antibiotics. And then following that course, you would generally repeat a PSA. So I guess the flip of that would be, if someone came in and wasn't necessarily symptomatic and you did a PSA was high, let's say you repeated it in a week and it was still high, it would not be wrong to, say, to try to do an exam, evaluate the prostate to see if perhaps there's inflammation or it bigger in size or kind of mushy, which is what prostatitis feels like. Try a round of antibiotics, see how they feel, and then repeat it again. So I think what I'm doing a really long-winded answer for is a single PSA should never be used to say, I think you have prostate cancer, go get a biopsy. It, it is very reasonable to repeat it, to ask people to abstain from sex or bike rating, repeat it again, try a round of antibiotics, treat it again. So you want to rule out all of those other things that could potentially falsely elevate the PSA before you sort of commit someone to the path that this might be prostate cancer. Does vitamin E increase prostate cancer risk? I don't know that data, but not that I'm aware of. How helpful are generic tests in deciding whether to have a prostate biopsy? I have a PSA of seven, and I'm being advised to have a biopsy. So again, I think the move toward biopsy sort of depends on where you fall in that sort of watchful waiting versus, um, oh, I just blanked on the name of the other test. Uh, Give me just a second. Active surveillance. So, you know, if you're young and healthy and your PSA is seven, it, 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 it kind of is your choice in discussion with your provider how you go about that. So you may choose to just repeat the PSA in three or six months and look at the velocity. You may choose to do the free and total PSA to get a better idea of your relative risk. If there are more indicators pointing toward a risk of cancer, the only way to truly know that is to do a biopsy and look at the cellular structure. So it sort of depends, again, on sort of your philosophical approach to how aggressive you want to be in working that up. If you want to know and you want to know tomorrow, get a biopsy. If you want to be more conservative, there are other tools in the toolbox in terms of these other blood tests that we can use to help sort of differentiate or quantify your risk. Do you know I actually misread that uh, that guest question. Uh, the question is, how helpful are genetic tests? Oh, so, I'm sorry, not generic. Yeah, yeah genetic. Yeah. So there are not clear genetic markers for prostate cancer. Um, we do know that there is a genetic tendency, but unlike the BRCA gene in, in women that we know you can just test for and, there, and there's an increased risk, we don't have that same sort of exact gene sequence to be able to identify in someone. That may come in the future. I think we're, we're doing a lot with genetic understanding, so that may be a test in the future that would be more helpful. All right. So um, I believe that we're, we'll wait just a moment or two and see if we get any more questions. If not, we will close our program. Great. Um, we certainly do appreciate your time and expertise. And um, so I 
am waiting for another couple of questions. Yeah, of course. But uh, so I'm going to just ask you about um, that you are a fellow in the American Academy of Family Practice. Mm -hmm. And um, what is that academy? What is that? So the Academy of Family Practice is the board certification for folks who did a residency in family medicine. If you do some extra training and sometimes some extra activities like teaching medical students or doing some other service projects, um, they sort of give you this higher level of accreditation called a fellow. It looks really good after a signature. Very, very good. Well, we're very close to 8 o'clock, so I'm going to join you up here and uh, say to our guests that we thank you for joining us tonight. We Certainly thank Dr. Bundy for his time and expertise. Um, thanks for all of your information tonight. A recording of this lecture has been archived for future viewing on bch.org backslash live stream. So you can rewatch this if you'd like to. You will receive a survey by email tomorrow, all of, all of you who are tuning in. Please take a moment to fill out that evaluation. We, we really appreciate the, the input that you give to us. And uh, thank you so much for joining us and be safe and be healthy and, and good night.